About two years ago, I made a rebuttal video to Austin from ShoddyCast about how the portal gun works. I was really proud of that video, and while in execution it may have come off as a little mean to Austin, he took it really well and we've become good, friendly acquaintances because of it. Wholesome 100, best ending reached. And for some reason, a few weeks ago, the YouTube algorithm decided to pick it up. Among the many comments I got on that video, there were a ton of requests to cover the science from the Half-Life series. I thought that was a great idea, except for the fact that I've never played Half-Life. I know, a game that came out when I was a literal infant is one of the ones I haven't played. What a shocker. However, I've seen the movie Free Guy and know there's a gravity gun I could talk about. Oh wait. That's in Half-Life 2. Well, I might as well just enjoy Half-Life 1 and figure something out. And this is a pretty great game in its own right, considering Dr. Gordon Freeman and I are both physicists. We've worked at high-tech research facilities, and we've both caused catastrophes at work that end civilization as we know it. Wait, scratch that last one. But that last one will be the topic of this video specifically, the Resonance Cascade, and if there's any real science behind this disaster. For a quick recap, let's go back to May 16th of 2000 and something to the Black Mesa Research Facility, some amalgamation of Los Alamos National Lab and Area 51. Working in the Anomalous Materials Lab, recent MIT PhD graduate Gordon Freeman is conducting an experiment. This involves a Zen crystal, some unspecified material from a border world, being inserted into an anti-mass spectrometer. This results in a huge explosion and an interdimensional bridge being created between Earth and Zen. Alien invasion ensues, the military gets involved, and you're left putting the pieces back together as you fight your way through. Half-Life has some pretty interesting science throughout its entire gameplay, including a moment where you flood a nuclear reactor with coolant to prevent a meltdown. This actually reminds me of my master's thesis, which was all about nuclear safety during unprotected loss of flow scenarios. I feel my background is pretty suitable to covering the most pivotal moment in Half-Life, the Resonance Cascade. What is a Resonance Cascade, and could it cause the end of the world? To understand what a Resonance Cascade could be, let's first understand what Resonance is. To do that, I've brought together one of my favorite instruments to play from high school symphonic band, wine glasses. When wine glasses are filled with water to a certain amount and the rim is lubricated and rubbed, you can hear a sound. Depending on the level of water, a different note will be played. What you're witnessing is resonance, and it's how all instruments are allowed to create such beautiful music. The definition of resonance is an occurrence with a vibrating object to cause another object to vibrate at a higher amplitude. Amplitude is essentially the energy of the sound waves, and it's proportional to the power. With the wine glass example, rubbing the rim is vibrating the glass, which causes the water to vibrate to create sound waves. You can see the artifacting that occurs specifically around the edge of the glass. When I apply more tangential force to the rim, this increases the amplitude of the waves, which in turn makes the sound louder. If I use a different amount of water, but roughly the same amount of force, I can generate a new pitch. This is because the frequency of the sound has now changed, thus changing the note which is being played. But what happens if I introduce a different material? This right here is a wine glass full of one of my favorite drinks, prune juice. It is super healthy for you and I would highly recommend you guys drink it. I have at least one cup a day. I filled the glass with the same amount of liquid as the first wine glass. When I play the glass of prune juice, it has the same pitch of sound, but the resonance time is longer and it sounds fuller. That's because sound travels at different speeds in different medium. In air, it's about 340 meters per second. In water, it's about 1500 meters per second. And in the thicker, fibrous prune juice, it's even faster. 
you're probably familiar with the opera singer breaking an empty wine glass with her voice. Well, the same principle is at play here. Resonance causes the amplitude of vibrations to increase. The shape of the wine glass is what makes it good for amplifying those sound waves. However, it also means it's easier to reach the elastic limit of the glass. An easy way to describe the forces involved to shatter a wine glass would be a cascade of resonance, since the resonance overwhelmed the material and caused it to shatter. However, we're dealing with something different when looking at the Zen crystal. The crystal is a pure sample, meaning it's probably easy to resonate waves within it. However, from the experiment, we don't see the crystal itself shatter. And based on its geometry, it's unlikely that it would even shatter in the first place. Crystalline structures help maintain their shape and form over different kinds of intense conditions and apply stresses. Usually, super tough materials like diamonds and carbon fiber are weak along just a certain cross-section. So the notes on Gordon Freeman's desk state that every object has a set resonance. If energy of a correct frequency is provided, crystals and objects have their quantum states excited. The game proposes that if this anomalous crystal from Zen resonates beyond a certain threshold, dimensional portals and rifts open between two locations. Now we've delved into the science of how the portals from the portal gun could actually work. Teleportation in Black Mesa is a bit more esoteric. I can't give any specific rationale to how it works in the Half-Life series just based on what's in the first game and the promotional material. However, I think there's some fragment of science that we can go into. So to tackle what's going on during the resonance cascade, let's break up the individual parts of the test chamber where it takes place. To start with, we have an anti-mass spectrometer. A typical mass spectrometer uses an ionization source, a mass analyzer, and an ion detection system to identify unknown compounds in a substance. This is done by converting molecules into gas phase ions so that they can be manipulated by electrical and magnetic fields created from external hardware. These ions can then be separated and analyzed based on their mass to charge ratios, which are compiled into spectrums like this. My very first research position involved xenon detection using mass spectroscopy, and it just occurred to me that you can't spell xenon without zen. I would venture a guess that this material they're analyzing has some anti-mass xenon component to it, but the spectrometer itself is being used to determine exactly what it is. Now what does anti-mass mean, or more commonly referred to as antimatter? It is just the same as mass, but with opposite charges. So do a switcheroo of the protons with the electrons to get antiprotons and positrons. This is a bit different than dark matter, which is the theoretical mass that doesn't participate in the electromagnetic forces, like neutrinos. However, after more than a 50 year search resulting in basically nothing, and recent papers opposed to the presence of dark matter, there's not much that we really even know about it. Since Zen is referred to as a border world by G-Man, I don't think it's much of a stretch to assume that this world is filled with anti-mass, hence the bridging effects. Now, as much as I wish I could create an experimental situation, like with the portal gun video, we don't have that budget right now. Let's talk about why this resonance cascade occurred. Based on the name, it assumes that that the amount of resonance created overwhelmed the system leading to the Black Mesa incident. Based on how the experiment was set up, it reminds me of a phenomenon that's observed in plasma processing related to the resonance time and Langmuir waves. This is based on my own experience in the semiconductor research and development field over the past two years, in which plasmas are generated to etch patterns on silicon wafers to create computer chips. Plasma uniformity is incredibly important to maintaining stable results. Plasma processing involves five major components, power, chemistry, pressure, temperature, and time. The type and amount of chemistry and your power settings are most impactful on the resonance time between different radicals, ions, and electrons in the etching process. For clarification, I've only worked on dry etching, which is most analogous to the setup we're seeing in the Black Mesa test chamber. Dry etching involves gaseous electronic devices compared to wet etches that revolve more heavily on chemical reactions and more types of chemistry. Do I think the Zen crystal itself is actually being etched? No, I'm just saying the plasma generated in this anti-mass spectrometer seems to be creating some type of atmospheric plasma that can be observed. 
Now the properties of a plasma, such as electron temperature, electron density, and potential, or voltage, can be measured using a Langmuir probe, or a very small wire attached to a power supply. This creates a non-linear plot between the applied voltage and the current. If a negative current is applied to the probe, it attracts positive ions, and vice versa. This can be understood with the equation J equals I over A, where J is the ion current density, I is the ion current, and A is the surface area of the probe. It can be simplified to being the product of the ion density at the sheath edge with the Bohm velocity, the speed at which ions enter the plasma itself. The sheath of the plasma just determines the shape and the density distribution radially. The reason Langmuir probes are important is because they can be used to measure instabilities or oscillations in the plasma known as Langmuir waves. Oscillations can be more defined based on the amount of chemistry being used in your plasma generation, which results in a longer resonance time between radicals, ions, and electrons. One way to mitigate non-uniformity is to apply a magnetic field at different radial distances on the plasma. Quantum excitation is also mentioned in Gordon's notes, and this aptly describes what's going on in the experiment at hand. Described in the Auger-Meitner effect, when the electrons of a molecule move from one energy level to a higher energy level, they enter what's known as an excited state. Electrons moving back down from higher energy levels release photons, or light, and energy. When the Zen crystal in the test chamber is moved under the plasma generation device, it undergoes a massive release of energy. Perhaps this is related to the esoteric qualities of the antimass of which the Zen crystal crystal is made of. So to recap, a resonance cascade is an event in which an overwhelming amount of instabilities and interactions of ions, radicals, and electrons are created by frequencies and vibrations in the Zen crystal, exciting the molecules so much that a huge amount of energy is released. And somehow this connects Earth to Zen. Do I believe it could do that? No, I don't even believe that aliens exist, so this game is all just fun to me. But in that fun, it's always great to learn about the related physics. I really hope you enjoyed this video. It was pretty exciting to talk about something related to the work I've been doing over the past few years as an engineer. Please let me know what concepts from the Half-Life series or from other games I should cover in the future. God bless, and I'll see you all later.